Rachel Bomberger with Erdman's Publishing. I'm here today with Kenneth Briggs, who is author of the new book, The Invisible Best Seller, Searching for the Bible in America. Welcome, Ken. It's great to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> I want to start by asking not about your career, which was very interesting, but about your childhood and about the place that the Bible played, the, the role that the Bible played in your family life, in your young mind, in the culture that you grew up in? My, my background was in a very, the first town I remember was a very small town in Massachusetts. The kind that people don't usually associate with Massachusetts when they think of the big cities. So this is a little dot on the map, 300 people. We had no library. There were very other few sources of stimulation of any kind like that. But we had a nice church in the middle of town, a little Methodist church with a supply pastor. And I went there with my parents every Sunday, and my brother and eventually my sister. And I came, became rather enthralled by hearing the words of the Bible because they gave me a perspective, a point of view, an opening of a whole vista of life and possibility and thought that I had never heard before. Um, we didn't discuss those things over dinner at home. Uh, so it became a, a stimulation and a way of thinking of life beyond the town, that, that they, there was a, a wider life to lead, a richer life to lead. They had all kinds of possibilities, including some fears, you know, like maybe things don't work out the way you think they're going to, maybe something else is in charge. But primarily, I got centered on what the prophets had to say, you know, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nehemiah and all the rest of them, that they were telling me about the ways in which societies go awry and what they need, which was adherence and allegiance to the basic uh, principles of justice, love, compassion, fairness, that uh, I didn't always see in my hometown, which was a very working class town. So I. Uh, where people were often mistreated at places of employment and other places too. So it gave me a fresh view of life's potential and the, the sense that there was a, a spirit, a profound spirit beyond uh, my own thinking or my own household. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's got me hooked. So the Bible was hugely formative for you, but it was also a fixture in society, and that wasn't isolated just to your town. It was something that was uh, common throughout the United States, throughout its history. Uh, the Bible was important. Yeah, uh, the Bible was represented almost everywhere. I think uh, one of the sources, for example, was the Reader's Digest. They used to come around, they always had some prominent allusion to the Bible in there, whether it was a story or a spin-off or whatever it could be, it was, it was uh, there. And it was in so many aspects of life. The, the quotes would be uh, found in so many locations. So yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a common staple of life, even though it wasn't necessarily obeyed or understood very well, <laughs> it, it was there. And it was given a great deal of respect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that Bible sat in our church front and center, and it looked about 500 times bigger than any book I'd ever seen, so you couldn't miss it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now, I think, you know, after, you know, in the decades since, things have changed a little bit in terms of the Bible's role in America. What do you see today that's different than what you saw when you were a child or what you read about you know, in the history before that? It simply has lost a great deal of the focus of attention, mm -hmm. even peripherally by uh, a lot of people. And uh, the actual readership has gone down so far as we can tell. And the, the references to it, even in cultural terms, has been reduced so that it used to appear in many more 
plays, books, uh, movies, although there are movies that try to uh, be addressed direct biblical material, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just integrated into the rest of society uh, nearly as much. There's a kind of forgetfulness about it, a turning one's glance away from it for a number of reasons, but it, it's just the attention span uh, was apparently all over with, or maybe couldn't exist under changing conditions of American life, increasingly uh, urban, secular, uh, not so interested in otherworldliness in any way, and it, it's just lost a lot of its centrality. Mm -hmm. And you, in many ways, have had a front row seat to these developments throughout your career. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about the, the stages that you've taken along the way and, and what you got to observe in your, in your journalism life? Well, I'm not exactly the Moses of, of uh, the trade, or I haven't seen only my own slice of life in history, and seeing, seeing it some back. But the, uh, uh, I think of certain periods of time I've lived through when the Bible sometimes rather indirectly played a great role. The Civil Rights Movement probably would not have been really possible without a good chunk of Bible uh, stimulation and inspiration. Uh, the, uh, the action against the Vietnam War was informed, at least in good measure, by a serious consideration of, of what it means to be a pacifist or what it means to be a, a conscientious objector. Uh, the, I believe that the, uh, the, the feminist movement, though it gets debated back and forth, some say it's the work of the devil, I, I think is an equal case to say it was a way of explicating and addressing what the theme of the Enlightenment said in the 15, 1600s, which was that we are all profoundly equal and the implications of that then being carried out through history, through, uh, through a, 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 a reversal of racial segregation, a, a reversal of, of, uh, of male dominance in, in many areas of life, uh, a, a reversal of even generational authority so that younger generations have more but that, that radical equality got in there, and it wouldn't have been there, I don't think, without the inherent uh, message of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the subtitle of your book, Searching for the Bible in America, sort of hints at your personal quest to find answers to the questions around the Bible, specifically, what happened to it? Yeah. And so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that quest and about some of what you found during your research for the book. Well, I went, I went to look for um, where the Bible still exists and the conditions under which it exists. For example, evangelical colleges, uh, people's homes, um, churches, um, uh, technocrats who are working with new approaches, say, to Bible apps. Um, a lot of kind of situations in which in the public discourse and politics you would normally find some traces of it to see what was there and what was not there anymore. Uh, a lot of different locations and not perfectly scientifically uh, Val validated, but you know, but a random sample that se would seem to at least give a decent uh, picture of what was going on. Uh, I went to other churches and spent quite a bit of time, usually in churches which where you would have thought they had some remnants of uh, biblical uh, literacy. Often they didn't. Mm. Um, and, and places that were still struggling to find a way to, to go ahead and keep it alive. So it was quite a mix of people, places, 
trying to test the thermometer at, at various points in the country. Now, it's obvious from research that even though many, many Bibles still exist, that most homes have at least one copy, and that they're in courthouses and hotel rooms, that it, it has been largely marginalized. What do you think are the factors that have gone into that? Why is the Bible lost its place? Um, I would say two things that I identified, at least. One of them is the difficulty that people have in believing in otherworldliness. And that is basically a requisite for reading the Bible and believing it has something to tell you. That has been the way it's always been presented, that God delivered this to human beings through this, through this mechanism. And the mechanism is not itself supposed to be worshiped, but that to which it points is supposed to be worshiped. And sometimes that's been confused in the, in the public mind and in a church mind. That's one reason that I think the Bible's been shunned by some people because it was taken to a kind of extreme worshipful place where it was being idol uh, uh, where it was becoming a, an object of idolatry and uh, and sacredness itself rather than being the the pointer to that sacredness so that kind of put a lot of people off um, the other thing is that uh, that that problem with believing that things are transcendent made it also possible to say that the Bible is basically produced by human beings and that it is, doesn't have a coherence that was sort of dictated from the other world. You kind of give that up. That leads to my, the second point I'd make, and that is I think part of the, 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 the backing away from the Bible has had to do with the huge gap between the scholarly endeavors that deal with, with biblical study, criticism, resource, and the congregations who by and large know nothing about that. And no, there was no attempt to try to bring that scholarship into discussion with what people's impressions were or what they were, believed the Bible was about. So the gap in understanding got very, I just become very extreme. So you have scholars who basically talk among themselves about all they have found historically, archeologically, and historically in every other way. And the public that is, has been left with an impression that nothing really changed. You just have a lot of experts trying to mess with it. And I think that kind of left a lot of people thinking, I don't want to take sides on this. And I don't understand any of it because the scholars are getting too sophisticated and technical. And, the, and what people understand or, in an ordinary sense doesn't go very far. In many cases, people don't know anything to begin with. So uh, a kind of hyper use by people who really good researchers saying, you know, Isaiah, so far as we're concerned, was made up of three different documents. Not a single document, not by somebody named Isaiah. It's a jarred a lot of people in the, in the pews who were saying, no, that's not the way we understood that. It was, there was no bridging. Yeah. There was no, almost no bridging. So both sides kind of got disillusioned with each other. And a lot of people just wanted to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that lost the Bible lost the Bible some possible adherents or, or those who were interested. Yeah. The data is pretty clear that, you know, the Bible is losing its place of prominence in America. But I want to ask you, if we lose the Bible, what do we lose? That's one of the questions I asked a lot, and I still ask. We appear to be, and I, I know people have been issuing Jeremiah's forever, saying this is the end of everything. But we do seem to be in a very serious crisis of understanding what life is about. Uh, beneath all the particular disputes over the economy, about the political structure, about so many, about the, the ecology, 
Uh, beneath a lot of that is, why do we need to even do this? How does this contribute to some kind of whole view of what, what life is like? And without even arguing that the Bible has to be the only answer, the fact is, with the Bible gone, it has occupied that foundation of understanding about what life is. When you remove it, there is a vacuum that is not being filled by anything comparable, I wouldn't think, but it is being fulfilled, I think, by the uh, idols of secular life. Money, power, success, um, victory. And I don't think that itself stands up, a material view of the world stands up very well in the long run because we get testimony after testimony that says basically, even with non-religious people, I tried all that and it didn't work. So it seems to me that the Bible remains extremely important as a resource, as at least one resource with which to either recreate a sense of purpose with some of the errors that went with the old biblical understanding done for. We no longer think slavery can be sanctioned fairly by the Bible. Most of us don't. So you have to come to, but to not consider its, its mind-widening, broadening dimensions as a way to go to try to escape the narrowness of individualism and self-centeredness, I think would be a, a big mistake. And there isn't anything except material success and competitive success that seems to be uh, naturally filling in the gap. And it's not surprising because the American way of life, which always heightened the importance of of uh, winning the game, maximum use of one's talents for, <laughs> for gain, which has a part, but was always restrained by a kind of counter argument from the Bible that said, watch out, because Jesus also does say about those rich people, it's kind of, they're gonna have a really tough time. It at least puts some kind of break on it and my sense is that there's not much of a break anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just wide open and there's no way to say, what, how do we put any of this in context? Mm -hmm. Ken Briggs, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. The book again is The Invisible Best Seller, Searching for the Bible in America.